Hi, let's talk about the autonomic innervation of thoracic viscera. In this video, we'll discuss the basic structure of autonomic innervation to the thoracic viscera, heart, lungs, and esophagus, with a special emphasis on the cardiac plexuses. Autonomic plexuses are aggregations of postganglionic sympathetic fibers with preganglionic parasympathetic fibers. And in the thorax, there are three major aggregations of such plexuses. There are the cardiac plexuses, which exist as both superficial and deep plexuses. The pulmonary plexuses, which exist as both anterior and posterior plexuses. And the esophageal plexus. There is extensive communication amongst the fibers of these plexuses, especially between the cardiac and pulmonary plexuses. When you're in the laboratory, you might be able to see some of the inputs of these plexuses, such as splanchnic nerves or branches, uh, the sympathetic trunks and ganglia, uh, the, the vagus nerves and, and their branches, etc. But you're very unlikely to see autonomic plexuses themselves because the fibers are so fine and they are enmeshed in the fascia, which are surrounding the viscera and uh, vessels that you're revealing. So oftentimes, in the pursuit of dissecting out structures, we're obliterating and removing these plexuses. So it's more important than ever that we have a fundamentally sound theoretical understanding of where these plexuses are, so that as we do encounter uh, regions where these plexuses would exist anatomically, um, we can appreciate them. So let's talk about those inputs. So it's an autonomic plexus. Uh, there's got to be both sympathetic and parasympathetic inputs to it. So within the thorax, the sympathetic inputs are all coming from various ganglia of the cervical and thoracic sympathetic trunks. The preganglionic sympathetic fibers are coming from typically the T1 through T5 level, but they can also include the, uh, the T6 level as well. But most of the outflow is T1 through 5 for the thorax. Um, and it's probably best to note that uh, visceral afferent fibers that accompany sympathetic fibers are visceral pain fibers. And so those visceral pain fibers are ultimately coming back to those levels and any of the dermatomes served by those levels are candidates for referred pain from the organs that those levels serve. The parasympathetic innervation for the thoracic viscera will all come from the vagus nerves, cranial nerve 10, and branches of the vagus nerves. The visceral afferents which accompany the vagus nerves and branches fibers are going to be conducting back feedback and reflex information. So let's start with the, uh, the sympathetic trunks and see what inputs they're providing. Now we're going to focus on the cardiac plexus but know that a lot of these fibers are also going out laterally to communicate with other plexuses, especially the pulmonary plexus. So we, we focus here on the cardiac um, plexus and we'll give greater granular detail in subsequent sessions to both the pulmonary plexuses as well as the esophageal plexus. But let's start with the cardiac. So as you may recall from uh, previous sessions, the cervical sympathetic trunk has condensations of ganglia into superior, middle, and inferior cervical ganglia. And some of these, such as the middle cervical ganglia, are variably absent. So generally, each of these cervical ganglia will produce cardiac branches. Sometimes these are referred to as cardiac splanchnic nerves. Um, and whatever we call them, it's important to understand that all of these branches here are 
postganglionic. All postganglionic fibers. So these branches are going to descend the neck into the thorax. Some of them will mingle with branches from the vagus nerves, which will also descend the neck with them to get an early jump on this plexus aggregation. The remaining fibers are going to come, at least for the cardiac plexus, from the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth thoracic ganglia. So one, two, three, four, five are heading out to the cardiac plexus. These cardiac branches, many of them are also destined to go to the pulmonary plexus. So specifically the T2 ganglion through T5 and sometimes the sixth ganglion will be cardiac branches out to the pulmonary plexus and then an even smaller subset of those T4 through T6 will head out to the esophageal plexus. Now there are various other splanchnic nerves which will arise in the thorax generally from the levels of T5 through T12. These are called the thoracic splanchnic nerves. Um, it's important to note that these are post uh, I'm sorry, preganglionic fibers, as opposed to the other cervical cardiac splanchnic nerves, which are postganglionic fibers. These are preganglionic fibers. They have yet to synapse in any ganglia and they are going to aggregate together as a greater, a lesser, and a least thoracic splanchnic nerve, head on down through the, uh, the diaphragm, and uh, synapse in prevertebral, sometimes called preaortic ganglia, which are going to serve abdominal viscera. And we'll talk more on that uh, in subsequent sessions uh, in sessions of this block as well as uh, sessions in uh, when we look at GI. Let's look at the parasympathetic inputs. So parasympathetic is rather parsimonious for us. Um, all of this is coming through vagus. Keep in mind vagus isn't exclusively parasympathetic. We, we've, we've discussed um, extensive both somatic motor and somatic sensory um, vagus contributions, but there are significant parasympathetic outflows from the vagus as well. And let's, let's look at those now. So coming off of the cervical region of the vagus nerve, or I should say the vagus nerves as they descend uh, the neck, there are superior cardiac branches. These superior cardiac branches are going to oftentimes join and mix amongst the cardiac branches from the, the cervical sympathetic ganglia to also descend the neck. Lower down in the neck, uh, closer to the root of the neck, there are branches of the vagus which are inferior cardiac branches which are also descending. And then there are going to be branches from the recurrent laryngeal nerves which will also descend into the coronary, uh, pulmonary, and esophageal plexuses, or I should say cardiac, pulmonary, and esophageal plexuses. Keep in mind there's asymmetry with respect to the pathways of the recurrent laryngeal nerves. The right recurrent, recurrent laryngeal nerve wraps around the, uh, the subclavian artery heading towards the uh, tracheoesophageal groove. The left wraps around the concavity of the aorta, so the left is much lower than, than the right as it goes down. After the vagus nerves pass the roots of the lungs, so those are the contents heading into the hyla of each lung, they are going to take less of a left-right um, orientation and more of an anterior and posterior orientation with respect to the esophagus, or we should just call it the gut tube at that point. And what happens is the left vagus nerve 
moves anteriorly, and there are some fibers from the right which join it. And the right vagus nerve moves more posteriorly, and there are some fibers from the left that join it. And both of these are transmitted with the esophagus through the esophageal hiatus of the diaphragm, and they're going on to serve the foregut and the midgut. The anterior vagal trunk will peter out very quickly. It predominantly is going to serve uh, the anterior stomach and part of the liver, whereas the posterior vagal trunk is the dominant parasympathetic um, source of innervation for the foregut and the midgut. One mnemonic that helps me to remember this is a LARP. So this isn't just live action role playing. This is the left vagus is more anterior. The right vagus is more posterior with respect to the, uh, the vagal trunks. So that leads us to the cardiac plexuses. And you know, it's, it's odd that we, we keep saying plexuses plural, but there are really two of them, a superficial plexus and a deep plexus. The superficial plexus is found anterior and inferior to the concavity of the arch of the aorta. Um, its inputs are going to include those cardiac branches from the superior cervical ganglion, especially on the left side, as well as the parasympathetics, uh, the, the superior or the cervical cardiac branches. Those are all descending the neck. And that's what really comprises that superficial cardiac plexus, again, especially on the left. The deep cardiac plexus is found sandwiched between the trachea immediately before it bifurcates into the main stem bronchi and the arch of the aorta. So if, if we can kind of go through that space, we're getting to the deep cardiac plexus. Laterally, it is contiguous with the pulmonary plexuses, many of the same fibers from the same sources. And in terms of inputs, uh, that deep plexus has those cervical cardiac branches. It also has the cardiac branches of the thoracic ganglia. In terms of the parasympathetic uh, cardiac branches from the, uh, the vagus, you know, superior and inferior, as well as branches from the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So the recurrent on the right is, is heading down and on the left it has gone under the arch and it's, it's there already. So the deep is a little more robust and it is in good contact with those, those pulmonary plexuses. Now let's talk about effects or responses. Keep in mind the, the sympathetic response is our fight or flight response. This is preparing us for battle or preparing us to flee from battle, so to speak. And what's it going to do? Well, with a sympathetic response, we'll see an increase in heart rate and an increase in the force of contraction of the myocardium. With that, we'll also see vasodilation of the coronary arteries. And this is fairly unusual because generally with a sympathetic response, we have vasoconstriction of arteries. But the coronary arteries are an exception from this. During a sympathetic response, those coronary arteries are as patent as they can ever be, and blood is flowing to that myocardium, which is contracting faster and harder than what is typical. So the parasympathetic responses, the rest and digest, um, heart rate will slow, and that force of contraction will be diminished. Commensurate with that, uh, we'll have vasoconstriction of the coronary arteries. We don't need as much blood flow going to the myocardium as it's not working as hard or as fast. And so um, tone can, can be reestablished there. So we've discussed the thoracic viscera, which have autonomic plexuses. We've talked about their inputs from the cervical and thoracic uh, sympathetic uh, paravertebral ganglia, as well as the branches of the vagus nerves. And we've highlighted as a particular example, the cardiac plexuses, both the superficial and the deep. 
This is your summary slide. Thank you for your time.